Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Belvoir PLC uh, Interim Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of the screen. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. These will be available via your Investor Meet Company dashboard. Before we begin, I would like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand over to Dorian Gonzalez, CEO, and Luis George, CFO of Belvoir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank Good afternoon. you um, for the very kind introduction. Sorry, Luis. Um, just to sort of add to the uh, the introduction, so um, two of us in the room, both Luis and myself. Um, on the second slide, if you could kindly switch on, Luis, we're um, so my name's Dorian, CEO, 21 years in the property sector, um, 15 years with Belvoir itself, in fact, just sort of in my 16th year. Um, both Louise and I have got um, shares, so we've got skin in the game, uh, very passionate about the property sector and very passionate about franchising um, in general. Um, Louise, 16 years board member um, on AIM and six years at uh, Belvoir. I think when, that can, when I look at my 15 years now, Louise, I feel like a sort of piece of furniture really when I say it's that long, but um, time, time does fly. Um, so we've we've also put on this slide just some insight on the operational and board team below um, below the board. Um, we've got ten of the um, sort of ten of the people in the business, and we have an MD or say ten of the people at the higher end of the business. Um, <clears throat> we've got an MD of each one of the brands, and I'll explain the brands on the next slide. But we've got an MD within each one of our brands, very effective, very experienced um, MDs, um, and. Louise did an interesting exercise last week when she put this slide together. So, you know, across our, our most senior people, um, across all of our brands, an average of 26 years of sector experience per person. So um, I started to feel old when I saw that, but, um, and an average of nine years um, service um, experience with Belvoir as a business. Um, numbers of shares in the hands of management, just shy of 5%. So if we, um, if we just run through the um, the brands to give you a you know general idea of what we are and what we do, um, we're the UK's largest property franchise group. Um, we've got 360, 396 individual um, businesses across five brands. Some of these brands you may recognise. Other brands are regional. Um, for instance, Newton Farlowell and Lavelle. But first off, on the top line, um, Belvoir. So we we first listed back in 2012, and when we listed our aim, we listed as a residential letting specialist. So we didn't have anything to do with estate agency or financial services or anything else apart from residential letting. So acting as an agent for a landlord, looking after their property and managing the, uh, the tenancy. That's, that's, the, that's how we listed originally back in 2012. Um, since then, we've grown the Belvoir brand to a national footprint of 167 offices. In 2015, we acquired a small sort of a, a regional um, estate agency chain called Newton Fallowell. <clears throat> Very productive business, Newton Fallowell, started by Mark Newton. Uh, Mark Newton sits on our main PLC board. Um, he's an exec director. He stayed with the business. Um, so Newton Fallowell was acquired in 2015. Um, Northwood, um, another national um, estate agency and lettings chain, um, operates all over the UK. Uh, we acquired that business in 2016 and then at the start of this year um i appreciate the timing when i thought about the timing of this deal in sort of march i thought was it really the right time to complete on a, on, a, on a deal when we were facing lockdown but we completed in january well before the lockdown was even announced and we bought a small estate agency business mainly lincolnshire based called lavelle estate agents and across the four brands just to give you an idea of, of revenue split um, so Belvoir and Northwood are very similar in that the revenue split is 90%. So this is the revenue split 
of, across franchisees in these networks. So 90% of franchisees' income in Balvoir and Northwood comes from residential letting. So that's recurring revenue. Uh, we collect rents each month from the tenant, deduct a management fee, handle maintenance, and manage the whole relationship, and then pass the residual amount on to a landlord. Um, that sort of recurring um, activity continue to happen dur during the period of lockdown um, and beyond. Um, so we, we're managing agents effectively. So 90% of the revenue in Belfort and Northwood is from that activity. Um, and just 10% is from estate agency. In Newton Fallowell and Lavelle, different, it's the other way around. Um, so Newton Fallowell and Lavelle, very strong regional um, estate agency brands. 75% of the revenue in Newton Fallowell and Lavelle um, comes from estate agency, so selling houses, um, and the remaining revenue comes from lettings, so traditional residential lettings. Um, below the line, um, so that the brand at the bottom may be a brand that you are familiar with, um, is Mortgage Advice Bureau. We don't own Mortgage Advice Bureau, that's a separate listed, um, separate listed business, but we choose to operate um, under the Mortgage Advice Bureau umbrella as far as mortgage advisors are concerned. So we acquired um, two mortgage businesses, um, one in 2017, one in 2018. The logic for making these acquisitions um, is that we're working towards having a mortgage advisor um, very close to every one of our property offices so that clients can access high quality uh, mortgage advice. So very logical, logical uh, match. But of course, if we want to offer a mortgage service across 300 uh, physical offices. Um, we need lots of mortgage advisors. So we, um, we, we've we made two acquisitions, but we've grown those businesses thereafter. Um, and we're now at 174 mortgage advisors. That growth in the last 12 months has sort of come from organic growth, not from, not from acquisition. So I hope that sort of gives you an idea of the, um, <coughs> the structure of the business itself. On to <clears throat> a few, excuse me, onto a few highlights. <clears throat> it's been a you know pretty challenging year, I think, for for most businesses. And um, the way I've described um, this year in our in our RNS and and commentary is that it's been a real roller coaster. You know, at, at certain points of the year, it's felt like a white knuckle ride. Then at other points in the year, it's been exhilarating. Um, but the 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 overall results are as follows. So here are the general highlights. Um, revenue up 8%, um, of which 2% relates to the underlying business. So even through the duration of the lockdown, um, we grew our business in H1. <clears throat> That's on the property property side. And um, part of the growth has come from the acquisition of Lavelle, um, but it's 2% underlying, 6% contribution from Lavelle. And the way that breaks down is that on property division, um, up 9%, um, that's the part that includes Lavelle, and on financial services, um, which we were, you know, we accepted back in March that financial services may take a hit because of the lockdown. Incredibly, you know, our, our, our spectacular mortgage advisors have grown. Um, the financial services division in H1, and it's up by 7%. That's nothing to do with any acquisitions. Um, that's just pure growth year on year. Part of that growth comes from the success that we had last year. We've had 23 years of unbroken profit and turnover growth. Last year, we grew our, our advisor base organically, um, and it takes a while for these advisors to start writing business and start producing revenue. So we've had some benefit of, of an increased um, advisor network in, in H1, but they've just performed very well in the first half now. During the lockdown, a mortgage advisor didn't do very much business connected to property sales because estate agents were told to close for, for two months. Um, so our mortgage advisors simply switched their energy and expertise into other products, i.e. remortgaging and um, and protection based products um, and that was you know effective for the period of lockdown and um, profit before tax up 17 percent basic eps up 16 <clears throat> percent um the impact of covid was substantially mitigated um <clears throat> by a program to reduce overheads and i'll go into that in more detail later on in the present in the presentation but we came out very early with a with a plan to reduce overheads we reduced overheads in march 
Um, so it started before the lockdown. Um, and then during the sort of lockdown period, we used, um, in a very sort of light way, we used the furlough scheme, um, which again, I'll come on to later on in the presentation. Um, cash generated in H1 from our operating activities um, was over 3 million. And the we're saying very clearly that performance is in line with management expectations and in fact we've gone further than that um, and said that um, we expect to achieve our pre-covid business plan and, and management expectations um, which is you know a, a strong statement to make um, when I think back to March <clears throat> I'm, I'm just delighted I can make that statement at this point in time and it just shows the strength and resilience of um, of our business model and also the strength and resilience of the market, you know, sort of post post lockdown. Um, operational highlights, I've already mentioned um, Novell. Um, I've already mentioned the, the financial advisor network. Um, one question that we're asked, um, we're always asked um, um, very often um, is what element of our gross profit um, is recurring from the, the recurring lettings element. And it's 62%. Um, um, 63% in H1 2019, but it's, you know, 60% give or take um, is, is recurring revenue, is from recurring revenue. Um, we also announced a few weeks ago a strategic alliance with the Building Society. Um, that's quite straightforward in that the Building Society wanted to pull away from a state agency um, and lettings. We've helped them do that, and we're continuing to help the building society offer property services to their existing clients so they didn't want to do it themselves they wanted somebody else to do it we we bought um 300 managed properties from the building society on behalf of well franchisees bought those 300 properties um and <clears throat> where we're going with this arrangement going forward is that in h2 um we intend to have a presence i.e a person a desk some branding um, in some of the, the the building society's high street offices, um, if you pin me down and said, "Well, Dorian, how many by the end of next, you know, by the end of this year?" Um, I imagine, you know, by December we should have a presence in ten to fifteen of NBS's offices, um, but that's that's um, that's work in progress. And then, you know, going going forward, we intend to work closely with the building society to um, to offer products and services to our client base that. We, we, we haven't offered before, so so fairly easy to understand. Um, <clears throat> I think we have had a question on that. It's about um, a flavor in terms of volumes and prospective revenues and what impacts. Um, so somebody's asking, you know, are there any numbers to put around that? I think right at this point in time, we've acquired th the management of 300 properties. Um, in terms of additional MSF, that's that's probably thirty thousand pounds a year, you know, broadly speaking, an extra MSF. Um, so a relatively small deal, and we we do a lot of these acquisitions each year. You know, every year we do sort of twenty five, twenty six of, of similar deals of maybe three hundred properties. So it won't move the dial enormously, um, but you know, I think having a presence in in some of these offices going forward um, will certainly help us to attract more new franchisees and help existing franchisees generate revenue. So that's probably the only number I can give you, um, <clears throat> I can give you at the moment. Um, other operational highlights, well, in fact, one of the main highlights, which I know investors are, are very, were very keen to um, understand our, our, our dividend position and, and rightly so, you know, very pleased to announce the reinstatement of our progressive dividend policy. Um, we've declared interim dividend of 3.4 pence per share. It was 3.4 pence per share this time last year. And as part of having a progressive policy, you know, we said at the time we wanted to keep H1 dividend the same um, and increase H2 dividend. So, I mean, firstly, um, normal dividend declared. And then secondly, we, we've we never missed a skip, a skip to beat on our dividend since listing, um, apart from suspending the dividend in March this year. So we, we are now declaring additional dividend of two pence per share um, to partially compensate for the suspension of the dividend back in March. Um, the board will review um, its position on the further catch up um, at the time of the uh, um, the final dividends sort of you know in Q1 next year. Um, we really need to understand what the market looks like before we take a view on that. But you know if if you sort of press me, um, I suspect our position will be fairly strong um, at that time um, due to 
market conditions, which I'll, I'll expand on um, shortly. Um, so that gives a total cost of 5.4 pence per share, which um, you know has been universally well received. Um, that's payable on the uh, 30th of October. Ex dividend date is the 17th of September. Okay, so um, the 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 general sort of impact of um, COVID, you know, what what happened? It was a difficult time for you know us as a business and for all businesses. We we our offices closed from the twenty fourth of March to the thirteenth of May, um, with restrictions on um, certain property related activities. And there, there was some good news in this. You know, if you can link good news to a lockdown, um, that when we when we sort of modelled the impact of COVID and the lockdown on our business. Um, back in March, we had no idea how long the lockdown was going to be. Um, so worst case scenario, we planned for a five month lockdown, which some sectors have had that. Um, best case scenario, we didn't see, we didn't think that the lockdown would be any less than um, three months. But government decided to unlock the property sector um, early, um, mainly because of um, you know transactions in the pipeline and all of the associated businesses um, that 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 are connected to um, the property sector. Um, so, so our lockdown was much shorter than we um, um, first anticipated. Um, the, the impact on our income was that we, we did lose revenue during the lockdown period um, simply because our offices were closed. So, you know, we, that we couldn't avoid um, um, losing revenue, revenue during that period. Um, hence, we used furlough scheme, you know, while our retail offices were closed for a short period, but we used it in a you know, very small way. Um, lettings revenue, interestingly, the, we, we've always said, you know, over the last few years that it's our lettings revenue that underpins the strength of our business. That's our recurring um, sort of revenue element. And just to make the numbers easy to understand, if you push financial services to one side and just look at our revenue across the whole of our, our franchise network, 80% of revenue is from residential lettings, it's recurring, and 20% is from a state agency. So during the lockdown period, uh, franchisees retained 90% of their lettings revenue, which is just incredible. So the lettings process didn't stop. Again, that's logical. You know, rents come in, we collect our fee, pass them to landlords, maintenance still had to be administered. Um, and for franchisees to protect that level of income was just incredible. Um, one of the questions that I had um, from a number of, number of investors back in March was around rent arrears. Um, so we, we're managing just shy of, of 70,000 properties. Um, some of the suggestions back in March um, were around rent arrears rising to maybe 40%, which, you know, at the time we said to investors, it's just not going to be that high. Um, and we, we modelled a 20% tolerance in terms of rent arrears. Now, we are better than private landlords at preventing and managing rent arrears. And I'll say that, you know, with a lot of confidence, um, our rent arrears are currently at less than 5%. Um, in fact, it's slightly less than 4% at present. And in, a, in, a, um, in, in an environment where COVID doesn't exist, so in a normal trading year, all landlords and agents have a level of arrears. Our, our arrears is normally around 2%. So it's kind of running at about 4% at the moment. It would normally be 2%. Do we see that increasing um, as furloughs unraveled, you know, towards the end of the year? Probably. Um, do we see it um, increasing a lot? Probably not. And I doubt whether it will have an, a material um, in, impact on our business. Um, quite a few questions coming through, which we'll try and tackle um, tackle shortly. Um, property sales income was 50% down. Um, that was just during the lockdown period. And bear in mind, the state agents could not easily complete on deals. And I certainly couldn't go out and accompany viewings during that period. So 50% down purely during the, uh, the lockdown. Um, financial services income, 13% down um, on 2019 during the lockdown. <clears throat> but bear in mind that in H1, financial services revenue increased and our property revenue increased. And interestingly, we've seen a surge in activity since we were unlocked, and that's both on the rental side and on the estate agency side. We sort of had a double um, upside on estate agency in that, firstly, we had the pent up demand. And then secondly, we had the stamp duty announcement. So stamp duty cut until March next year. Um, I'll come on to that in a little bit more detail um, shortly. Um, 
and the you know i can say with confidence that our pipelines of sold properties so deals in the pipeline that will either fall through or complete in the next few months um, are at the highest levels that they ever have been it's just unprecedented and that's not just our business making statements to that effect you know i think a lot of agents are um, saying exactly the same thing um we did reduce costs i think one of the questions is about this but we also reduced costs i say very quickly so before the lockdown we reduced our head count by 28 um that may sound high to some people or low to other people but we um you know at the time we had about 160 on our payroll you know give give or take um a number of the staff had come with or you know percentage of staff had come with with Lavelle we're also running a higher number of retail units than we wanted to be running um that's simply because of the acquisition of Lavelle so there were, there were we always plan to reduce headcount in in a in a you know to a, to a certain extent um and at the time we were operating from when we reduced by 28 we had 12 locations Louise if memory serves um so you know it's it's kind of two per location there or thereabouts we decided against furloughing or uh, furloughing any staff at our central office building um, in Grantham because what we knew we wanted to help franchisees survive through a difficult period and we poured support into our franchisees over a very intense period. I needed my best people to do that um, so we didn't furlough any of our central office team apart from um, a receptionist who we didn't need temporarily because the building closed um, um, during the, the lockdown period. Um, we also used furlough, so in, in a very light way. So so in, in sort of round numbers, we of, of 150, 160, we made about 20% um, redundant um, on a permanent basis. Um, of the remaining um, percentage, we, we furloughed about 20%, and then we kept 80% on payroll as normal. Um, board and senior personnel reduced their salaries for the lockdown period on a voluntary basis. And of course, we've got the obvious cost savings where we're not traveling around and buying coffees and staying in hotels and, and spending money on fuel. Um, Dominic, it, might, it might be worth on this point bringing in Tim's question, because Tim was yeah. asking about um, right move and Zoopla costs, you know, being a major cost for lettings agents and, and asking whether we negotiate pre preferential rates for our franchisees and also asking whether we're on the market. And I think it would be fair to say as part of our cost reduction, we did negotiate with suppliers across the board. Um, but I just wonder whether it's worth you addressing that question now. Yeah, definitely. I can't say that one. So the um, so right I'll, the oh, I've got it. I've got it. Got it. Got it. So, yeah, got it. So, so yes, yes, we do. So the short answer is yes, we do negotiate preferential rates with both Rightmove and Zoopla, and the discounts that we get are um, for just economy of scale. You know, if you look at how many offices we've got, we get what I think is a pretty good um, deal with with both. Um, we also have a an arrangement with on the market. Um, so i mean during if, if you're an investor in right move um you may have seen that during the the lockdown period and and, and beyond um that both right move zoopla uh, and on the market assisted their their clients with either discounts or payment holidays or a combination of both um but yeah yeah to answer your question um yes yes we do so just moving on to answer the question louise that particular one i think it does yeah, yeah. thanks um, so sort of impact on cash flow which we've um, which we've set out um, so h1 bank balance of 4.3 million um, includes of that deferral plus the suspension of the dividends so the cash position will change and um, the bottom bullet point on here so no arrears in money's due no increase in arrears from uh, uh, money, uh, based around money's due from franchisees what, what I refer to there is that a main question that we had um, back in March was, you know, what if franchisees stop paying? You know, what if their business gets in difficulty and they, you know, they're locked down, they can't generate any revenue, they can't pay. Um, and you know, I'm very pleased to say um, that we haven't lost a franchisee due to COVID, either health reasons, and we haven't lost a franchisee during the whole of this process due to COVID-related business reasons, and we've not seen any increase in arrears. Um, in money's due from franchisees that just didn't happen and um, we've been very supportive with our franchisees they've been very supportive with us we have i feel you know a very strong relationship and i genuinely feel that franchisees value the sheer volume of, of support that we poured into them over the um, over the lo lockdown period it was hard work but um but well worth well worthwhile okay what? 
think, Louise, that's probably over to, over to you and give me a break for a second. Yeah, give you a break. So although we've got the um, the main um, income statement here, if I just move on to the next slide and talk through um, some of the factors underlying that. So revenue was up by 727,000, um, and that included five, an in revenue increase of 572,000 <coughs> associated with Lavelle, which was 6% growth. Um, and the underlying business increased revenue by 155,000, being another 2% of growth. Um, within our within the revenue, MSF, our management service fees, which is our, our key um, income stream from franchisees, that decreased by just 1%, um, with the lettings being pretty much on par with the first half of last year. Um, and the sales being 5% down. I think it would be fair to say that the sales would have were, were, were mitigated, you know, that we had help with the sales because we had acquired the Lavelle network, um, which was the franchise part, it was predominantly sales driven. So that did help um, the sales comparative. Um, the six, six of the Lavelle offices that we acquired were um, corporate owned. We do intend to franchise those out during the remainder of this year, um, but they added 493,000 to revenue in the first half. Um, and financial services um, was up 7%. That was very much benefited from having a larger, um, sorry, it was down by, it was up by 7%, yes, um, a larger advisor network um, this year than, than last year up. Um, and gross profit is up 8% to 6.7 million. So just looking at the overheads, our, our overheads were up 314,000, um, but obviously Lavelle itself had increased overheads. We had 537,000 pounds worth of costs in the first half relating to Lavelle. 36,000 of that um, was at the sort of legal acquisition fees associated with buying it. And 32,000 was amortization associated with the um, acquired intangible. Uh, and then that left 469,000 of operating costs directly related to the Lavelle business. And against that, we did receive um, government COVID support of 78,000. And that did enable us to support the, the staff um, to keep those offices functioning, um, or that those businesses functioning during the, the lockdown period. Also within the overheads, we've got 36,000 of redundancy costs um, associated with the reduction in the headcount. Um, so when we actually get down to the underlying business, the underlying business had reduced overheads by 259,000, very much um, relating to uh, the sort of areas that Dorian's covered already, the, um, the lower headcount, um, the senior team, the board and the senior management team took a voluntary salary reduction during the lockdown and we negotiated discounts from suppliers and also the general home-based working and limited travel. This slide really just um, reiterates the degree to which um, the lettings underpins our, our business, the recurring lettings activity. For the full year last year, it represented 61% of gross profit and for the half year this year, 62%. So still a very much a key part of what, what supports the business. I'll just take a look at the statement of financial position. Um, our intangible assets are up by just under 2 million in relation to the Lavelle acquisition. We also have a, an amount of 2.9 million, um, or sorry, 3 million of franchise loan book. This is where we use this, this money to support franchisees in um, doing their assisted acquisitions. Um, and, when we, and I'll cover that in a little bit more detail when we come on to the cash flow statement. Um, Bank balance at 4.3 million, that's having acquired Lavelle, um, so that's having spent out almost 2 million. Um, we did suspend the final 2019 dividend payment and we deferred 473 of that, um, which was is repayable by March next year. Um, the bank loan, um, the bank loan outstanding is currently 10 million. Um, so that gives us a net debt of 5.7 as at the half year. If I look at the net debt today, because I think that was one of the questions I noticed earlier, the net debt as of today is 4.7 million. The, the bank loan um, is repayable in half yearly instalments of 445,000 with the final repayment in March 2023 is 7.9 million. And the interest rate we're paying is 1.95 over LIBOR. But just looking briefly at the cash flow, um, it's a highly cash generative business. Um, 
we generated just over three million pounds of cash in the half year. Um, two million has been spent on the acquisition of Lavelle. There was a little bit of deferred consideration, 37,000 in relation to small portfolio acquired last year. Um, I said I'd come back onto the franchisee loan book. Um, we actually, get, because we appreciated as you went into the COVID um, lockdown, um, we were concerned to what extent franchisees would struggle. So we actually offered all franchisees who'd taken a loan out under our assisted acquisition programme the opportunity to have up to six months capital repayment holiday. And, and understandably, quite a number of them took that up, which meant that the there was a reduction in the repayments from franchisees of 183,000. But in actual fact, against that, we saw others who who took the opportunity to accelerate and do an early settlement on their on their loans. Um, to clear it out the way, so a net effect, effect of 100,000. I think I've covered our bank sufficiently. So just to say that the interim dividend cover, the interim dividend being 3.4 pence, um, had covered 2.1 times. So I think on that point, Joanne, I can probably hand back to you. Okay, so... Um... We've not got too many slides left. There's sort of two or three slides left. That's all. So just general um, sort of operational highlights um, in slight, slightly more detail in some areas. And this may answer one or two questions. Um, so number of franchised offices, um, we're at 308. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier, well, right at the beginning, that we're very passionate about franchising. And um, franchising normally performs well, you know, across the board during a recession. So when unemployment um is is very low and people can sort of you know pick and choose their jobs and wage growth is strong um you know franchising has to work harder to attract people to uh, to join but obviously in a period where unemployment is um is rising um franchising provides a route that is somewhere in between true self-employment and um, and employment so you know it's just a point towards to make about franchising um so there are always movements within the franchise network whereby franchisees open second or third offices and bear in mind our model works best on one franchisee one office it doesn't necessarily work best when a franchisee has multiple offices and that's simply because it's a complex area you know housing is a technical complex area it's very knowledge intensive um, therefore having a franchisee at the heart of each franchise just works best for for our model um, but there are movements and we've explained those movements below the, um, the first um, box um, we don't allow franchisees to cannibalize other parts of the network. Um, so a Newton Fallower franchisee can't buy a Northwood franchisee and shut that branch down. That's just not not how we operate. That's my choice. That was something that we put in place when we decided on the multi-brand strategy. And it actually works well for us. Um, it means that our footprint isn't sort of being cannibalized by our own franchisees. Um, there are so many other acquisition opportunities that you know franchisees need to look sort of further afield, not on the doorstep. Um, number of a number of financial advisors I touched on earlier, so 174. Um, that's for 136 this time last year, and that's organic growth, not acquisition. Um, assisted acquisitions. Now, assisted acquisitions um, slowed for us during the lockdown period, but of course, though, you know, it was going to. So, from a buyer's point of view, if you were a franchisee um, looking to buy an acquisition, take one of your competitors out and invest in, you know, a, a, a business. Um, I think you probably would have put that that buying decision off for a few months to see how the market landed um, after the, the lockdown. So we knew acquisitions would be temporarily put on hold. We didn't put our, our acquisitions team on furlough. We kept them working throughout the whole period of lockdown. And, um, and I'm sure we'll see, you know, a return on that decision later in the year um, last year we helped franchisees acquire about seven million of extra revenue um, it was about that number the year before um, will we get to seven million this year is pretty unlikely you know is, is my view um, but we'll certainly increase from the position that we're at now so it'll be we'll end up somewhere in between um, there are lots of potential targets again a, a question that has been asked about that um, you know are there, are there lots of targets out there there are, you know, the, the sector is still very much dominated by just single office operators, independent agents. Um, and at some point, these operators want to um, want to exit and sell. Um, we, we've been a good buyer of these businesses over the last five years. And we've 
we've helped franchisees complete on about 100 of these deals over the last five years. I see that increasing towards the end of the year, um, but, you know, difficult to put a, a number on that. Um, number of managed properties continues to increase. That's the final sort of um, point. Um, we're at 69,000. Um, we're Just, second only. Oh, sorry, Lucy. No, no, carry on, Dorian. Huh? In a minute. I was going to say, before we move off of this slide, um, Henk has asked a question about mortgage advice, how many more mortgage advisors before we saturate um, our network of franchisees. I just wondered, as we've got the advisors on this page, it might be worth addressing that. Yeah, I mean, we, we've, we've got a long way to go still with the um, um, to correctly sort of cover the property network. So if the property network is about 300 physical offices and we've got offices in Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales, England, you know, there's a pretty, pretty good geographic spread. The majority of our mortgage advisors, um, certainly, I guess, two thirds to three quarters, came via the acquisition of two businesses. One was uh, Mav Gloucester, uh, one was Brook Financial Services. Brook, when we when we when we acquired the business, was based in Barnsley. Therefore, a lot of the mortgage advisors that are within Brook are based in in that region. Um, exactly the same with MAB Gloucester. Um, We've got a fair chunk of advice in the southwest. And to answer your question, Hank, we, we need to get up to maybe 250 advisors to you know, adequately service the um, the property network that we've that we've got. And it's very logical, you know, um, clients do want access to mortgage advice and it makes absolute sense rather than to farm that out um, to have our own mortgage advisors and bring benefits to us as a business and to our to our franchisees, along with the uh, with the control that that brings. Okay, so I've worked on to the next yep. one there, Louise. So yep. the, the, the general, a, a general sort of market update, you know, here's, here's a few of my thoughts and I appreciate that um, when, when I start talking about the market, you know, the property sales market, especially that people have got their own views on which direction the market will go in, will it go up, will it go down? Um, so here's, we've put out, we've set out a few facts first of all. So in terms of um, the rate of rents increasing year on year, um, rents are increasing by around 1.5%. That's the year to June um, 2020. Um, our average rent, which isn't on the slide across our portfolio, is about £750. So 93% of our business comes from outside of the M25. So we're not subject to the, although we do have some offices within the M25, our average rent across all of our properties is, is around 750. Um, we've been running the longest rental index um, in the sector. It's been running for got to be 12 years. Um, and if you want to have a look at the rental index, just Google Belvoir rental index. Um, and the rental index over the last few years has been showing increases of between one and 2% generally speaking, um, different to the property sales sector. Um, the number of new tenants uh, reached a record high in June 2020. I think we're probably pointing out the obvious. Um, and I say that with a smile in that, you know, if tenants were, were locked down, um, if a tenant was particularly unhappy with their property because they didn't have a home, a, a good home office, they wanted a garden, possibly it wasn't big enough, um, of course, those tenants are going to come out straight out of lockdown and do something about it, um, i.e. move house. And the rental sector moves pretty quick. You can view a property on Monday and you can move into that property on a Friday if, you know, if, if, ever, if all the stars were aligned. Um, I suspect the pent up demand on, on as far as lettings is concerned has now been satisfied, but that's different on the uh, on the property sales side. And of course, there are always regional variations. So, you know, you'll see, I suspect city centres may not perform particularly well this year in terms of rental inflation. Um, East Midlands, West Midlands has been performing very well, Yorkshire, the Humber, um, and we are particularly strong, as I say, outside of London. Um, on the residential, um, sales side so again a few few stats for you um so uk property transactions fell by 25 percent in in the first half of this year and 55 percent during lockdown um for the last few years we've been sort of cruising along at around 1.2 million uh 
property sales each year um, across the UK. Um, of course, that number will fall during a period of lockdown when agents were told not to complete on complete on deals. Um, house price inflation. So, you know, first couple of months of this year was really positive for the sales market. You know, election had gone, lots of positivity in the sector. House prices going up, as you can see. Um, so 2.9% increases um, um, in house price inflation to May 2020. Um, to put that in perspective, this time last year it was 0.9%. And if if we apply that to London, um, London in the last 12 months has gone up by around 2 2.9%, touch less than that. The prior year, prices in London had fallen by 0.9%. So you know a different different picture. Um, but highest prices have been rising at the highest rate for two years. Um, I've made made it clear that there was a sort of surge of activity from this pent up demand. On, on the property sales side, and and this this was further fueled by the stamp duty um, announcement. So you know, I, I personally think that it was maybe early to to make the stamp duty announcement. Maybe it was leaked, and you know, if you leak anything about stamp duty, you've got to get on with it. Otherwise, it can cause a lot of damage to um, you know the hundred and fifty thousand transactions that are in the pipeline. Um, maybe that stimulus would have been better, you know, sort of March, April next year. But you know, it's it's done. Um, it's out there, and the the sort of effect on our sector is, um, as I say, unprecedented. So the market is very busy. Our sales pipelines are, are um, larger than they've ever been. So we sort of um, and that's in financial services and the state agency. Now, we won't start to see the benefit of that until this month, so September and beyond, um, because it takes two to three months for a house sale to complete. Um, around a quarter to to 30% of house sales fall through. Um, it just takes time to convert those deals, but we'll see these coming through in um, in H2. Now, that's another reason why we're confident that we're going to meet the sort of full year pre-COVID expectations um, in, in 2020. Um, mortgage market showing signs of recovery, but as I said earlier, that is very much related um, to the success of the, uh, the sales sector. So that's just general general sort of um, views on market. Happy to answer any questions as well on, on market, because I appreciate people have different views. Um, just to sort of close down the, the formal presentation, you know, a few last, last points. Um, I've been preaching, I think preaching is probably the right word, um, the virtues of franchising for a very long time. And, and I've also been preaching the resilience of franchising. You know, we, we listed as a business in 2012 um, on the back of a, you know, a property crash. Um, at the letting side of our business performed incredibly well after 2000, sort of between 2007 and, um, and 2012. And we, we listed on the back of that. Um, we've got a lean sort of flexible um, structure centrally we don't have many corporate offices like the the corporate estate agency chains so we're very agile and flexible as as we've demonstrated over the last few months um different to some franchise networks who are starting out with financial services that we chose to acquire brook and mab gloucester because we wanted the best people um, who came with the acquisition but we also bought in historic data so a client um, database that dates back about 10 years without that database we couldn't have performed as well with financial services during the lockdown because you know if our offices were closed who did we sell you know who, who were we selling products to and um, we had a very strong database historic database which carried us through the um the lockdown we really did make the most of that um i mentioned that 62 percent of our gross profit is recurring that's from our lettings revenue um, and hopefully you'll agree that um, action taken both by management and by franchisees has, um, has helped us produce you know what is a, an impressive performance in um, in H1 um, the general outlook going forward um, record pipelines in financial services and in a state agency um, record levels of activity which you know most agents are reporting and um, you'll see some movement with the nottingham building society in h2 where we start to occupy their um some of their their branches um bank balance of the 5.2 reinstatement of the um of the dividend which um i've had a number of messages from investors today saying they're very pleased about that um and um the board, just to be clear, we remain confident that we will achieve our pre-COVID expectations come the uh, come the full year. So, believe you me, it has been a roller coaster. Um, 
I can't, I, you know, it's when I look back to sort of March, I never would have imagined to be in a position now where I could say, look, we're going to achieve the pre-COVID sort of expectations. And I very much liken it to, um, you know, a speed hump. So we sort of hit a speed bump, you know, it slowed the um, the car down. But as soon as the tyres um, hit tarmac again, then we sort of accelerated and um, and we'll continue to accelerate, you know, for the um, for the remainder of the year. So that's the sort of the formal presentation um Finished. So thank you very much for having patience um, to listen to uh, Louise and I. Shall thank we have you. a go at some of the questions? Yes, yeah, right, so certainly. One, one that's right. probably needed. Oh, sorry, sorry. Mark, yeah, Lo, let, let me, if I just give you a, a chance perhaps to get some water and everything before you dive into it. Mindful, we've got about uh, 10 minutes. Um, but I just wanted to remind, ladies and gentlemen, obviously, that they can continue to submit questions using the Q&A tab on the right hand of the screen. Um, but just obviously, while you take a few moments to review the Q&A today, the recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides, and the published Q&A can be accessed uh, via Investor Meet Company dashboard. And I guess before we go back into the, the, the Q&A, obviously investor feedback is incredibly important to the company and that immediately following this presentation, uh, you'll be redirected for the opportunity to provide feedback in order that the company can better understand your expectations. Now, obviously we had uh, two questions that were pre-submitted that I'd like to throw uh, at you guys first, just to put uh, some clarity. Then obviously what with the number of investors that, uh, that follow uh, you, and the number they've accepted today. You've obviously had a significant number of questions today. And of course, uh, timing wise, there's no way that we'll be able to get through all of them. But just to reassure investors that the company will be able to review all questions submitted today and we will be able to publish responses where it's appropriate to, uh, to do so. Um, so perhaps if I can just throw these two questions uh, out there, can you break down your revenue streams for the business and how flexible is the cost base? I know you've addressed some of this within the presentations. Yeah, I think I think a lot of it is addressed in the presentation. Um, the um, in terms of the revenue stream, um, I'm just sort of looking for where we've got the it in the. Um, but fundamentally, 61 percent. Yes, it was on the slide, wasn't it, that we covered earlier? Um, if I just go back to that, this is probably the best way of seeing it on this on this one, where we've got 62 um, percent of revenue arising from lettings. 19% um, from sales, 18% from financial service and 4% from other, which is things like franchise sales. Um, so I think that probably covers that. Well, how flexible is the cost base? Um, I think beyond what we did earlier this year, not massively, because we, you, ha you do have a fixed footprint in terms of offices, a certain number of staff to um, manage the business I think the elements that were variable in terms of you know the, the staff and the corporate shops and some of the financial advisors that's where we were able to be flexible back in March um, but that's some uh, I would say most of the remaining costs are fairly are fairly fixed but one thing to remember with franchising is of course we have a very small cost base compared to the sort of business that we're operating because our franchisees are operating their own offices um, and the question about recurring revenue I think we covered that here 62 percent is recurring from lettings thank you very much indeed um now obviously I don't know um if I hand over to you guys to to take the questions that have been pre-submitted and then obviously um you know you've got about 10 minutes um, give or take so feel free to to do what you need if you need to extend no problem yeah, okay, well, I thought one great. that I might just kick off with because it would be easy to deal with. And, um, and one of you asked about the map options. Yes, we do have 40, we, we did at the half year have 40,000 share options in Mortgage Advice Bureau. Um, they vested in actually in May this year. Um, they were nil cost, well, one pence options. Um, and we have now, we have since sold them. So we, we never were intending to keep them long term. Um, equally, we weren't looking to sell them in May when they, we, they first vested um, because the market was generally flat, but we have since sold them. Louise, sorry, and uh, I forgot to mention, if you wouldn't mind just reading the questions as well, just because oh, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, my, yeah, sorry. my apologies. Yeah, sorry, Henk had asked whether that we have these 40,000 options in Mortgage Advice Bureau on the balance sheet. Um, what's the strike price, which was one pence, and um, are we planning to exercise them? Yes, we have, and yes, we sold them. Thank you. And Louise, they, they came from, it was sort of an incentive um, offered by MAB, wasn't it? That's how we ended up with those shares in the um, in the first place. We ended up with them through the acquired businesses of um, Newton Fallowell, Mab Gloucester and Brooke, all of whom 
um, were um, associated with Mortgage Advice Bureau um, when these were figured up. Um, so when we acquired them, we became the proud owners of these 40,000 share options. Thank you. No, that's good. And um, do you want me to grab a couple, Louise? I've had um, a couple from yeah. Richard S. Yeah. Um, we've also had one or two from the same same gentleman about the furlough scheme, which I'll come on to in a second. So um, but Richard S, first of all, um, um, says that um, it seems a little unfair to be asking you about growth after the difficult six months you've had. But how do you plan to turbocharge your top line growth? Um, do you have aspirations to continue sort of 20 percent plus top line that we've achieved in recent years? And how how might we do that? Um, and. Richard's second question as part of that was, are we seeing more franchisees wanting to use our, our assisted acquisitions, 5 million loan um, book pot, um, and are there more opportunities coming through? So I'll, I'll do those. Um, it's not unfair to ask that question, Richard. I think it's something I ask myself, actually, probably every, every few days, you know, where will the next stage of growth come from? And I think it's fairly straightforward to see where growth will come from. So firstly, um, It'll be the growth in financial services, which, um, you know, we've, we, we see lots of opportunities on that side. We've got the right people. Um, we've got something that mortgage advisors need, and that's a database and a client base and 300 areas with, within which they can transact with potential clients. You know, mortgage advisors need access to leads. They need access to transactions. And we've got that. That in itself makes us attractive for mortgage advisors to join us. So it's a kind of, you know, a win-win situation, both for the franchisee who has that platform and for the mortgage advisor who wants access to it. Um, and they both benefit from, you know, that sort of income um, cross income generation. So that's one area. I think NBS will add some going forward. Um, but, you know, I think as somebody else rightly pointed out, it just depends how many how many offices we end up occupying um, and how that relationship plays out. But, you know, NBS are a, a good forward thinking um, building society and they're very interested in developing the sort of, you know, the property side of the business through through our network. Um, they can then focus on, you know, what 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 they do best. Um, acquisition is an interesting one. I mean, we um, there are lots of acquisition opportunities out there, both at corporate level and at franchisee level. Um, you know, we, we've proved, proven over the last five years that we can do a fair number of them. We've also proven that we've got massive appetite to continue doing them. Um, you know, the, the lockdown and, and sort of subsequent difficult few months um, just sort of put that on into, you know, a bit of a freeze on that temporarily. Um, but we're now seeing the, um, the thaw. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, that franchisees, and I think they were right to do this, um, sort of said as far as acquisitions are concerned they want to see how the market plays out but you know the franchisees now are really busy and that they're, they're actually more confident in many ways than they were 12 months ago because they've seen they've traded successfully through an exceptionally difficult challenging period and um you know many of them aren't very keen on growth you know some of our franchisees the majority have actually grown businesses from sort of zero to hero they've grown from a standing start um you know these are great people they're very hungry um, they want to continue to improve their lives year on year. And this is the key difference between our business and a corporate estate agency model. Um, you know, we've got a, a motivated and driven franchisee at the heart of every single business. Um, if, if you own a corporate network of, of estate agents, you know, you've got branch managers running offices. And I'm sure some of them are good, but I'm, I'm, I'm also sure that some of them aren't very good. Um, and of course, when... Um, lockdowns or, or, or sort of external factors come into play. Um, I would much prefer to have 300 entrepreneurial franchise owners um, with all the creativity that brings in comparison with, you know, sort of 300 branch managers. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so the answer to your second, so so we're saying NBS, we're saying from um, financial services, we're definitely saying from acquisitions. And, and interestingly, I mean, there's one area that's not in the presentation, and that's um, sort of standards and professionalization of the sector. So, you know, that there's cross-party support for um, all agents, estate agents and letting agents to be fully regulated in the next few years. There was a report produced in July last year called the ROPA report, which stands for the regulation of property agents. Um, if you're interested in property, that's worth a quick read of and certainly the executive summary because it makes recommendations. It was headed by Lord Best. Um, it makes recommendations such as um, or, uh, that there should be a, a new governing body, you know, a new regulator across agents. 
that agents should have a license, that agents should have professional mandatory qualifications, and government has already started moving towards um, at least one of the recommendations in, in ROPA. Um, but, you know, the professionalisation of our sector benefits everybody, you know, tenants, landlords, buyers, sellers, um, it benefits everybody. So there is sort of, you know, a lot of support for uh, that to happen. Now, my point being that, in my opinion, I, I am a landlord and I have been for a long time. In my opinion, um, the, the, the wild west of property lettings is amongst not all, but, you know, a small percentage, but nevertheless, a, a number of private landlords who are either blissfully unaware of the 150 sort of rules and regulations that um, um, dictate how you should manage a property safely and lawfully, um, or they, they simply ignore the rules. Um, letting agents can't do that. We have to follow the rules. We have to um, 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 manage properties correctly. At some point, it will no longer be acceptable for private landlords con to continue to operate outside of the rules. And, you know, if, if, if a new framework is introduced that says you must follow all of the rules and you must have a license and you must have qualifications then I put and and, ha, and give your tenants access to an ombudsman scheme then ultimately I think that will drive more business to um, to letting agents um, on the sales side um, there there aren't that many sort of private deals happening so it is different on the sales side but you know ultimately um, the sales side is performing well the 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 rental sector would benefit or the agency rental sector would massively benefit from uh, you know change in regulation but have a look at it it's called um it's called ropa it's um it's out there for everyone to see um so scrolling down do you have any oh in fact there was a question on on sort of furlough um in fact the same same gentleman martins asked two questions same same subject um just asking about whether why we are choosing to retain furlough money um and you know our dividends being subsidized by furlough payments well um they're not a dividend isn't being subsidized by furlough payments because we could have made it um without the the subsidy um but you know i see your point on furlough it's a fair question to ask i mean in my mind we have we've done what we were asked to do in terms of furlough so we didn't use it heavily we used it for across a minority of our you know a small percentage of our, our head count it was about 20 percent and all of those people have returned to full employment. So we've done exactly, we've used furlough um, to help keep these people in jobs and to continue employment during the lockdown period. And bear in mind that we had retail units that were forced to close. And if you, you know, if you compare our revenue this year against last year, we, we lost a chunk of revenue, you know, during that period. So I think we've used it appropriately. I don't think we've abused it in any way, shape or form. Um, and what we are going to do going forward, I didn't realise, I don't, I don't believe this is the case anyway, that there's a race amongst companies to, you know, quickly repay it and 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 sacrifice sort of growth or sacrifice investment in jobs going forward. Um, you know, I believe, I think that money's going to be well used going forward um, as we sort of grow the number of people on board and, you know, grow, um, grow, grow on that side. So, you know, it's not, it's something that we, you know, we will, we may revisit in the future, but you know, ultimately, you know, our position is is our position at the moment. Um, so hopefully that answers both of your questions, Martin. Um, let's have a look. Any more from um, Hang? Um, in fact, I think John asked a similar question as well. Um, Michael asked about um, sort of what percentage of franchisees pay, what returns do they make, and what mm. are the advantages of setting up on your own versus a franchise model. Um, well, just to be clear on the franchise model, so a franchisee can't close their business and then set up in their own name because ultimate, the ultimate goodwill um, of a franchise um, is owned by the franchisor and vested in the franchisee while they have a franchise agreement in place, so they can't just switch. Um, but I think it's... a uh, um, it's that feeling of belonging to, you know, a, a similar minded network um, people share problems, people share ideas. Um, we negotiate discounts on their behalf and um, we provide the business format, including website, emails, internet, so email security, um, documents, training, legal advice, insurances. We provide the framework so that a franchisee can spend more time and effort in growing the business and therefore hopefully become more profitable long term. You know, that's the you know, it's a similar spirit um, across um, all, all franchise models. 
Um, how are we doing so far? So, Louise, can you? Um... I just thought thinking there was some there was some good one. There was a good question I spotted. Well, so actually, Michael's asked about um, the threat to the lettings agency from disruptive online business models. So, mm. on the lettings, specifically to lettings um, from the online model. Yep, not a problem. So the, um, I mean, there have been sort of, you know, there, there was a lot of fears three or four years ago about the um, the online um, estate agency disruption models. And, you know, I'm sure you've got your own views about those. But in terms of, if we look at the estate agency first, I'll just jump onto the letting side because they are very different. Um, so last time I looked, um, all of the online estate agency models put together um, had grabbed around 7% of all UK transactions. Therefore, 93% of vendors still um, were choosing the, the no sale, no fee option, um, as, as coupled with a, you know, the local expertise of an agent who understands their locality very well. Um, and that's after spending hundreds of millions of pounds on marketing. Um, no disruptors have impacted on the letting side of the business. And I think that's, mainly for the reason that lettings is really labor intensive um you know if if there's a water leak in a, in a building and water's coming through from the second floor to the first floor to the ground floor i'm afraid that there's no app or um, it solution that's going to help resolve that problem <laughs> without sort of boots on the ground and without manpower um and you know it's that sort of boots on the ground that we we provide um to landlords i mean across our whole business there that there's around two two and a half thousand sort of franchisees and staff um, in total. Um, we deliver hands-on property management at ground level, um, and again, that's something that um, IT can't replace. Something I mean, it can facilitate, but it certainly can't replace the the duties as such. So, um, so no impact that um, that I'm aware of, not yet. I think same same question, same same gentleman again was an earlier question. Is there any pressure on letting agents fees? given the extra burden on landlords. Um, you know, not particularly over the last few years that I, I've seen and letting agents are doing, of course I would say this, but letting agents are doing a hell of a lot more now than for landlords than there were sort of five or 10 years ago. I actually think that landlords, especially after having been through the lockdown, and bear in mind that legislation will be passed very soon um, that will insist on landlords giving six months notice um, if they want to use Section 21 to take possession of their property. Um, I actually think that landlords value their agents more so because of the technical expertise the agents um, bring, to the, bring to the management of their property. There's a good question here from Bob, Bob M. Um, how do you help franchisees to grow their business? Which I think we have kind of covered to some extent in terms of the type of support. But he says, and how do you see individual franchisees becoming richer as well as your shareholders? I think we had some, you know, there we, I think it's worth covering the resale side of our business and some of the success that our franchisees have had on that recently. Yeah, I mean, that's, that is a good question because, you know, the, the, there, there are a lot of sort of um, um, franchise models. There are a number of these where franchisees can work from home, build a kind of business, um, and, um, you know, I, I don't know how much they're turning over, but I imagine it isn't a great deal. You know, the average turnover is, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 thousand pounds, I imagine, um, for a home run estate agency model. Um, but if you're a home run agent without any staff, you've got to ask yourself, is that really a business or is it a job? And, it, and if you want to sell that business, what exactly are you selling? Um, all of our franchisees, bar maybe one I can think of, um, is oper they're operating from commercial premises. Um, some franchisees employ as many as many as 30 people and some franchisees are sitting on quite significant assets. Um, we helped a franchisee to sell a, a two office network um, a few years ago and that was sold for 1.6, 1.7 million. And that business had been grown from a standing start. Um, so, you know, it depends, Bob, whether you, you, know, you think that's getting richer or not, but you know, these assets are growing each year in, in value. And, you know, if a franchisee takes an acquisition on, that also adds to their asset value when they want to retire in sort of five or 10 years time. So it's not just the profit on the on the way, but they can also, you know, sell the business normally for a, a multiple of, of turnover when they, um, when they want to exit. Um, interestingly, we still have our very first franchisee um, ever. Um, he's still on board. He's he's getting old or older. Um, he's on the north coast of Scotland, or north coast of Scotland in Elgin, Andy Campbell. Um, but he was our very first franchisee. Left the forces, joined us, and um, you know we're very pleased that he's still. Um, I won't be able to say this forever, but you know very pleased that <laughs> yeah, he's still um, he's still on board. 
There's another interesting question from Hank. Um, do you expect to grow your franchisee network organically in up, up and coming years, either the number of franchisees, I guess, franchise territories, instead of only growing MSF per franchisee? In other words, are there still people that want to join the business as a franchisee? I mean, I think people join our business in two ways. Sometimes, but you know, we see people join them into resales, as, as the type you just discussed, but also into um, into new territories. I don't know whether you want to cover our, the shift on that that we're seeing. I think it's really what I what I said earlier. I mean, you know, franchising normally performs better in a in an environment where um, un unemployment is rising because it's an option. Um, you know, if someone wants to earn a living, they can look at franchising as a potential route for that. Um, I think, I mean, you, you may remember, Hank, um, that, if, that a few years ago, we effectively stopped cold starting. So we, we don't really encourage franchisees to start from a standing start um, because the investment level is fairly high and it's fairly risky, you know, in any franchise model to, to do that. Um, we wanted to make it, you can't ever make it zero risk, but if a franchisee either buys a resale, so an existing business, or if they join us and buy an acquisition and rebrand that with our assistance, um, they've got business coming in on day one, you know, it's instant MSF, it's profitable for us, and it's pretty safe for the um, for the franchisee to, to join us. And when we look at this half year, we actually had five new people, five new franchisees join us. Three of them took up an existing franchise office, so they, that was a resale. One has come on board through an assisted acquisition and one through um, actually joining us and converting his own independent business to, um, I think actually he's, conver he's converted to Northwood. So we are still getting new people into the business, definitely. Um, but it has been, it ha and something we've highlighted in the annual report, it has been important to us to see growth, not just in terms of numbers of offices, but also in terms of the franchisees themselves which I think we reported at the half year, um, the full year last year, something like 43% growth over six years. Um, and that's um, that's good for our franchise network as well. Mm -hmm. Dora Louise, I know, I know you've, um, that's okay. you've, yeah. you've, you've, you've gone through numbers of questions. I know it's quite difficult to scan them as well, given the number mm. that you've had. So um, perhaps, um, obviously, investors are aware that we can review these questions post this meeting. And of course, you can publish responses to those where it's appropriate. Perhaps if I maybe, uh, if you would like to wrap up, perhaps, and then I know, as you said earlier, that feedback is important. So um, we can then direct investors so you can better understand their views. Yeah, happy to. So um, just, you know, last comment is, you know, thank you very much for listening. We've had some brilliant questions and some great engagement. And, um, you know, thanks for people who said thanks after putting the questions forward as well, which is uh, which is which is superb. Nope. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Mark. Thank, thank you, you Louise. Thank you, Dorian. Um, could I ask, please, investors not to close the session. As I said earlier, you'll be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide feedback. If you access this via the uh, link in the email, uh, you'll be asked to simply log back in. Or if you came through the platform directly, the form will appear. Um, on behalf of Belvoir, Dorian and Louise, I'd like to thank you uh, for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session. Good evening.